The most successful automobile segment right now is the five-seat SUV CUV. And traditionally, when you thought of that, you thought of this. This is a Jeep Grand Cherokee. I mean, Jeep was a pioneer in making a big, capable, do-it-all five-seat SUV. If I'm gonna buy an SUV, well, it's gotta have a lot of space, and so my mindset is different. I'm not, this car must handle great, and it must drive fantastically through corners. I don't care. This is actually the recipe. It's got a 5.7 liter V8 in it. It's got a good amount of power. It's got a good amount of space. It weighs 5,200 pounds. But there's this category now of SUVs that still try to do that, but they're getting smaller and they might just be your only car. The car you drive every day should be fun. But it has to do the boring stuff too, like commute, be affordable, and haul your groceries. You can have both and we'll help you find it. Fun to drive cars and great driving experiences for everyone on Everyday Driver. Now, Paul's had a few problems with this. He's had a few little surprising issues that have gone wrong. The nav screen quit working. The HVAC controls down here, this module just stopped. And then over time, I felt more and more grinding on the wheel. And it turns out all the hydraulic fluid had leaked into the boot at one of the edges. There was no oil in the rack. But by and large, it does its job incredibly well with a lot of space and a good amount of luxury. That's the thing that seeped into all of these SUVs is they all have to be luxurious now. This is not a car with launch control. This is not a car to hoon down a canyon. It's a car to haul your boat with. So the question becomes, what are these others? Even though I have loved the huge, heavy, lumbering G, this class is becoming so relevant to buyers. Smaller, lighter, more car-like but they're also representing this weird thing that's happening where you have a CUV SUV that's also trying to be your sports car. This car has a dry sump. It has a PDK transmission. You could track this. Six piston brakes on this. Who is this for? Well, probably us now that I think about it, but this is why we're driving these cars because it is that SUV discussion and yet they aren't. Porsche has survived and expanded and brought the thing that I love the driving experience to every single one of their cars. This Macan and the Cayenne feel awfully different. This feels much more Porsche than the Cayenne, even though the Cayenne is a car that pretty much saved Porsche's life. The only thing you need to know about this car is we've gone even smaller in size. We're almost in a hot hatch category. The reason Todd and I never bring this car up when we're talking about hot hatches is because it's too expensive. This is essentially a hot hatch masquerading as a car with a big ride height. It doesn't even have a big ride height. It's a hatchback. I've been in Golf GTIs where I sat higher than this. The GLA, even in base form, looks like the angry teenager of the Mercedes lineup. The 45 AMG version really sells it with the lowered stance and the absurd wing. But this AMG version is much lower with 20 inch wheels and a huge diffuser at the rear. It's a bit of a design trick, and I actually like this look better. The GLA design feels more cohesive after AMG gets done with it. Inside it looks great and it has spectacular seats. Unfortunately, the controls and materials feel a little more appropriate to a base $30,000 version than a $60,000 plus. There are some cars that struggle with the balance between luxury and sporty interiors. But if you want a good example of something that does both well, the GLA AMG 45 is up there. I'm not a huge fan of the nav screen location, but despite being at the lower end of the Mercedes price scale, all these materials are honest and everything feels expensive. Porsche did a great job of giving Macan a Porsche look from Q5 source material. I wish the bigger Cayenne looked this good. The styling is pretty clean, and you're not gonna mistake it for any other brand but Porsche. It always turns my head when I see one. 
I like how the shapes relate all around the car. One of the major contributors to this is the clamshell hood, which keeps the design intact. There's no part lines in the usual places, just clean sheet metal and headlight punch outs. And the taillight design is one of my favorite parts of the car. The Macan feels the best inside, with great seats, a decent amount of room, and materials and build quality that match the high price. In keeping with the Porsche interior themes, there's lots of buttons, but I like what they do for visual breakup. The Macan is going to look good and appear expensive for a long time. You feel like you're getting your money's worth in here. The Jeep Grand Cherokee may be the best looking traditional truck design on the market. It looks modern and still says rugged Jeep. The scalloped body side shape and the overemphasized fender flares look really good on this size of SUV. Inside, the big Jeep is nicer than its history suggests. The leather and materials exceed my expectation and there's a lot of room in here. Even though this is a big SUV, it still has a good mix between being a comfortable, luxurious truck and being chunky and rugged. The Uconnect system is one of the easiest and most enjoyable to use, and all the materials feel appropriate to the price of the car. All of these are mid-300s in horsepower. They just go about it differently. So we're dealing with very similar output. Everyday Driver is brought to you in part by Covercraft. This car's got the V8. There's really no way I wanted anything other than the V8. I'm getting an American truck, I want a V8. And you know, I'm glad I did because it's got smooth power and Todd has said that this just makes it effortless. Because of that enormous engine in the front, this has the most torque of any of these, but it should because this has a traditional V8 up front, which is what trucks are supposed to have. This could really off-road. The other two, not really. But on the other end of the spectrum, this big Jeep is not your track car. When did we get to a place where SUV is supposed to also equal, I'm going to run a canyon, hey, have I taken this to the track yet? Funny enough, I am the world's most obedient driver regarding speed limits when it comes to this car. We live in a world where even a big truck like this gets paddle shifters on it. Is that necessary? This does have the great eight-speed ZF transmission. It's one of the best automatics out there in pretty much any vehicle they stick it in. Of course, it's great here again. Everything throughout Porsche's lineup is now turbocharged. So the Macan turbo is a turbo and the two liter four cylinder all turbos. You don't want that one. That's got a four cylinder, doesn't have a dry sump. If you're gonna go this way, at least get the S. But of course you can do GTS and you can do turbo. So the Macan only comes with this engine, it only comes with the PDK. If you haven't driven a PDK, it is brilliant. And of course it's every bit as brilliant here as it is in all of their other uses. This is the only transmission you can get, so it instantly makes it a little bit sportier. All of these are mid-300s in horsepower. They just go about it differently. So we're dealing with very similar output. This is actually the second slowest car. Well, that's not the right way to put it. This is slightly slower than that Mercedes. You know, because you need to leave the carpool lane as fast as humanly possible. This is what launch control is doing on your Macan. That makes all kinds of sense. Hang on, kids, we're going 90. Things said in the Macan. I'm gonna start a line of shirts. It's gonna be great. I've been wondering about this car so much, specifically for the engine. It's a two liter that makes 355 horsepower. Wow. Okay, so you know AMG has gotten a hold of this car clearly. They're wringing every last bit out of this tiny two liter. Oh, there's the light switch. <laughs> See, that's the party trick. If I'm driving a high-strung, turbocharged car, that's what I want it to do. Whereas I feel like the Macan, the turbos are very measured in their response. Whereas this one is a little bit more wild. It, it kind of wants to play. It is possible to catch this engine napping. You drop down a gear, you punch it, 
you can find that it's not quite as ready to give you all of that boost as you would have expected. Sometimes it's just not ready to go. And I like the noises when it shifts. <laughs> Honestly, this car sounds like it's farting. That's, that, I just don't think that's a good noise. I kind of like the sound of it under acceleration. It's the crackle on overrun that just feels a little overdone. But that's actually this car. This whole car is a bit overdone. Have you seen the wing? Guess what's keeping me from going fast? Guess what's holding me up? Corolla. Yep. Just plodding along. Awesome. The one problem with this car is the transmission. This is where everything gets let down. I feel like it's almost got a torque converter on this car, and it's not. This is a DCT. In the Macan, we have Porsche's great PDK. In this Mercedes, we have Mercedes dual clutch transmission. They should feel pretty similar. Yet the PDK just, just kills this. It doesn't feel much different than the traditional automatic with not really sporty paddles in Paul's big Jeep. If we're gonna go nuts, Mercedes and AMG, let's go nuts. You've come this far, so why not make the transmission even more crisp and sharp? What's the balance between making it good for families and just good to drive around in and enjoy? I drive differently in the Jeep than I do in just about every other car because it feels so hulking and heavy to me. And then from the outside, it doesn't really look that big. You take this big girl down to a hairpin like this, you put it through a corner, what's it do? Well, it rolls quite a bit. Now, this is built on an old Mercedes-Benz chassis. It's sorted pretty well. It doesn't get wallowy at all. It actually is fairly buttoned down for something that weighs almost two and a half tons. Throwing an SUV through corners, that's not something we do. That's, that's not something you're supposed to do. I'm surprised to find myself trying to find the edges in a Macan. This is what we do in Evos and WRXs and all those kinds of cars. That's not something we should be doing in an SUV. This feels like a lightweight sports car compared to Paul's Jeep. However, it does weigh 4,000 pounds. No hot hatch in history has weighed 4,000 pounds. I am continually disappointed in electric steering racks, especially when they're like this and they're a variable ratio. They just, they lack feel. It's precise, but it doesn't have good feel. What's the balance between making it good for families and just good to drive around and, and still making it really feel like a Porsche. I'm actually thinking that Paul's confusion is the confusion of this class of vehicle. It's not a sports car, but it's not a truck either. So what expectation do you bring? You know what? <laughs> Everybody who's just driving this on a daily basis might not want good to drive around in and enjoy, but why not? It's a Porsche after all. I mean, come on. If you said to me, chuck one of these down a back road, I want the Macan. The Macan says, all right, you wanna do that? Let's do more of that. I always kind of had the GLA in my mind as a very tiny CUV. That's not the case. This is a full-on sports car. We're now even into the mid 3000s in weight. So this is sports car in weight as well. It's almost a foot shorter than that Macan, and the Macan is not big. Of course, being that it's smaller, it feels far lighter on its feet and far more nimble. And there's other cars that have better feedback to the wheel here, but the precision is there. I feel like the precision that I like about the BMW M2 exists in this car. This makes the Macan feel soft and wallowy, and it isn't. That Jeep may as well be a rolling planet compared to this car. 
this is the fun thing that I want out of this car. If I'm buying a lumbering SUV, I'm not driving it like I do this. This corner's like those hot all-wheel drives, like the Evos of the world. This corner's like that. You still get to hang it out a little bit and, you know, really drive fast and hard through a canyon, but it's a mature gentleman's car at this point. I don't think this takes the place of a spacious SUV. Everyday Driver is brought to you in part by our friends at Amsoil, who are devoted to protection. If your person wants to have one car that feels like it is your utility vehicle, and yet you want to be able to blast it down a canyon or maybe take it to the track, that is the new breed of these cars. And they are the same price as this. Hatches in the US have become this thing that a lot of people don't like because I don't like wagons. Okay, but hatches and wagons, forget it. So the problem that we have here is because hatches have some sort of weird stigma, somehow you can get away with a slightly lifted hatch and now that's okay and cool. Now I'm confused. Does Porsche know their market? Well, yeah, they do because they're selling boatloads of these. I'm not sure they've really hit it. And I am loath to say that, even though it's a larger SUV, CUV kind of a size, I'm wanting some crisp something out of this that it just isn't giving me. For me, the Macan might win this, and it might win this because it does the best job of doing everything. It's not quite as nuts as that Mercedes. It's not quite as usable and big and true truck as the Jeep. But if you are looking for a blending, out of these three, with this kind of money, this really does it all. It's strange to say that. It's like finding out your babysitter's an Olympic athlete, but it is the case. The Macan doesn't know what it wants to be. Same with the Q5. It's good, but it's neither car, nor SUV, nor anything else, really. When you want to buy an SUV, get an SUV. If you bought this as any kind of utility vehicle, you are now shopping not against other SUVs, you're shopping against other hatchbacks. You could buy a GTI, you could buy a Golf R for $20,000 cheaper. I don't think this takes the place of a spacious, roomy, run to the airport, put a bunch of people in it. But you know what? The back seat in this car feels more spacious than the Macan. Here's the problem. If the GLA is not the AMG 45, I don't want to own it. I don't want to buy the base model of this car. It almost shouldn't exist because it is neither fast and sporty like this, nor is it a spacious SUV. I keep thinking about the competitors for this GLA 45, and technically the competitors are things like the Audi Q5 and that Macan that we're in. Those are the direct competitors as far as what this is supposed to compete with, but I think that's wrong. I think the competitors for this are the Evo, and the STI, and the Focus RS, and the Golf R. Once you've grown up, and you've gotten past the WRX, and you're out of an Evo now, and it's just too boy racer for you, this is what you get. This is the next level. You can't grow up too far, though. This is a child's car. It doesn't have a child's price tag, but this is a car for children behind the wheel. Luckily, I am that child. Then there's the part of me that thinks, all right, do I need all this space? I want it, and I've used it somewhat, but do I need all of it? Well, that's where these other two come in, and I kind of am thinking in the back of my mind, is this where my future is going with an SUV? Because I just bought it. I wanted the size, I wanted the Jeep. It's a wonderful place to be in here with a good amount of space. Now, the seats don't hang on to you. Why should they? The engine doesn't have a dry sump, but what do you need that for? This is the benchmark. This is what this has always been. And now it feels old school. Maybe I'm wanting too much of a sports feel out of this thing, and maybe that's a deliberate move on the part of Porsche to not make that feel built in, but I want it. I almost feel like I get more out of the Cayenne. If I were looking for an SUV, I wouldn't buy this. However, if I were looking for an all-around, this is a really good contender. 
because you really could go chuck it down a canyon road. And when have you said that about an SUV? But you also can just say, I have a family, I need to haul stuff, and it's luxurious, and it's a pretty nice ride, fairly quiet. There is more wind noise here than the Cayenne, though, and actually more wind noise than the Jeep, if I'm honest. This car delights me far more than the Macan does. As it sits, I will take this car, I will take it, and buy another SUV to go along with it. All right, Mercedes, I'm officially impressed. This is very fun. Not that usable, very fun. Good brakes, good engine, great handling dynamics, marginal transmission. See, I mean, okay, if I were in an SUV, I would not be worried about potholes off the side of the road. I'm borderline terrified. Further proof. We all drive cars every day. They need to meet our budget and our needs, but they should also be fun. That's our whole premise. We're a small outlet, and we love what we do. We do these big multi-car comparisons for TV and web, but we also do single car reviews. We have a long-term series going. And once a year, we make a huge feature film, from the only full retrospective of the 9-11's first 50 years, to affordable exotics, the ultimate enthusiast road trip, and an examination of the M3 and its offshoots. Plus, twice a week, we do an audio podcast, The Car Debate, where we help you find a fun car that fits your situation. So we hope you'll join us for all of it.